I'm going to talk about some historical research I've been doing, um, which the context and the content may not be of particular interest to you, but I was very struck as I was doing it, how, um, um, how uh, selective a lot of the historical accounts are. And I'm actually going to talk about how women, despite being at the very first, on the very first uh, missionary expedition from uh, uh, Britain, um, at the very beginning of the 19th century, how they've been actually almost completely erased from history. And um, I'm going to link that to the use, and as I say, misuse of secondary uh, sources. Um, I have to apologize for the Trumpian discourse here, but I wrote the abstract just when this notorious um, <laughs> term, alternative facts, came out. So um, I apologize for that. Now, Moraine just told me how to do it. And in the um, uh, abstract, I did uh, suggest um, three questions. Do we place too much trust in se secondary sources? Are we too willing to use secondary data uncritically? And if so, how should we interrogate such data? And it hadn't really occurred to me that, I mean, we all engage in literature reviews. If you're writing a, a, a thesis, um, or dissertation, or an essay, you're, you're, you're bound to refer to some um, uh, literature. And you may have just a brief overview, and that's enough. But sometimes you want to look more closely at a piece of uh, secondary uh, data. And I, I, I suspect that uh, often we don't do this critically enough. We don't ask ourselves questions about who and who did it and when and why and was it part of a, a bigger narrative or did it challenge uh, the dominant narrative and so on. Um, and so you might want to depend on a piece of um, uh, uh, published research, for example, to do your own piece in a different geographical location or, or on a different age group or whatever. Um, so um, I, I found it very interesting to, to think about how we use secondary uh, uh, data. Um, the most famous case, I think, of the misuse of secondary data is in what those of you who are here in 2003 would remember as being the dodgy dossier. In the run-up to the Iraq war in 2003, um, the uh, Americans and the British uh, produced a dossier of evidence uh, to say that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. And that um, it was only 90 minutes, I think. Was it 45 minutes or 90 minutes? Um, for, for a weapon to, to reach us from Iraq. And at the heart of that dodgy dossier was a PhD thesis and uh, somebody had uh, written about uh, Saddam Hussein and weapons of mass destruction. And six paragraphs were taken from this person's thesis and uh, put unacknowledged into this dossier that was presented to um, the House of Commons here. And later, when an inquiry was held, it uh, transpired that really nobody had interrogated that data. Nobody had looked. I think the research had been done quite a few years ago. It was taken out of context. And in fact, it was beefed up to make the case for war. And so that's a notorious example of the misuse of uh, secondary data. So um, I'm going to um, try and give a very quick overview of the historical context. And then I'm going to give some examples of how uh, primary sources have been misrepresented. Um, I've just about finished a book. It's taken me a long time. It's called Excuse Me If I Speak a Word. That's from one of the letters from one of these women, Reclaiming the Women of Britain's First Mission to Africa. Uh, very quickly, the place is the newfound colony of Sierra Leone and the area that is now Guinea to the north of Sierra Leone. The period is 1804 to 1826. 1804 was when Britain sent its first missionaries to uh, Africa, uh, um, Anglican missionaries. Uh, the Church Missionary Society had been founded just five years before by a group of evangelicals. The most famous is William Wilberforce. Um, and it coincides with the uh, movement to abolish the slave trade. Um, I've written up, or tried to reconstruct, three women's life stories. Um, Sarah Hartwig, Elizabeth Renner, and Susanna Klein, those are their dates. All of them were married to German <coughs> missionaries because, interestingly enough, there were no British volunteers for the first um, 11 years. 
They were all Lutherans um, recruited from a religious seminary in Berlin. And these were all married to them. And what was quite interesting was no shortage of British women ready to go out to Africa when there were no British men ready to volunteer. Um, these three women are among the 40 out of 87 who served on the mission during this period. So the 46% were uh, women, but they account for only 4% of the correspondence. So it was not normal practice for women to write letters uh, in any official capacity. Um, and so these women stand out because uh, they wrote the majority of the letters. So I started thinking, why, why were these women um, writing uh, letters? Um, I want to just go on, in case Mireille gave me this fancy thing. This blob here is Sierra Leone. This is a, a map later in the 19th century, but in 1804, Sierra Leone was really just the town of Freetown. Um, and the first, um, you may know that uh, Sierra Leone was created as a, a home for freed slaves. And the first um, uh, former slaves uh, arrived there in 1787, uh, 411 of them. Their ships, three ships, set sail just shortly before the uh, first convicts sailed, the first fleet sailed to Australia with convicts. Um, and most of them died, because they arrived in the rainy season. <laughs> um, and the colony nearly disappeared, but it was revived by um, another group of former slaves who came from Nova Scotia in Canada. And what had actually happened was, um, because Britain was doing very badly in the American War of Independence and it was losing, it encouraged slaves to run away from their masters and mistresses and to join the British forces and in exchange they would get their freedom. Um, when Britain was defeated in 1783, um, quite a lot of uh, former slaves who'd run away um, found their way to England uh, on ships as sailors and 3,000 were evacuated to Nova Scotia along with the white um, uh, Americans who had fought on the side of the British. Um, but they didn't like Nova Scotia very much, they, it was very cold. And um, they were very badly treated and there were a lot of white loyalists who had fled there were embittered because they'd sided with the British and so, um, um, 1,192 former slaves um, asked to be taken to this new colony of Sierra Leone, and they arrived in 1792. Um, the um, Church Missionary Society sent its first missionaries in um, uh, 1804. And the, the, the people who headed the um, movement to abolish the slave trade, uh, William Wilberforce being the most uh, famous, were also involved in the creation of uh, the Anglican, Anglican Missionary Society. It was a period of great sort of um, evangelical revival and philanthropy and so on. So, what then happened was that these uh, first, um, oh hang on, I've got another map, a close up. There's free time. Those red blotches are, are presumably British territory in the year the map was done. But at the time, it was really just the tiny tip of free time on the tip of that peninsula. So the missionaries were there first, um, but then they formed their first missionary station up here in, on, the Pong, on the Pongo River. It's now in Guinea. And actually, it was the heart of a slave trading uh, region. And their first mission station, which actually was a former slave depot, they were called a factory. Um, and they were given this uh, former factory and for 10 years they ran the first mission, the first British mission settlement was there but they were driven away um, after the abolition of the slave trade in 1807 uh, the British Navy started patrolling the coast and capturing slave ships and the slaves uh, would be uh, taken to Freetown where they would be given their freedom and settled in and around uh, Freetown. Um, so hostility built up against the missionaries who were believed uh, to be government spies and they were driven away after 10 years and they then moved into the uh, colony itself. Okay, um, I want to just go back to the women, the three women. Um, I'm going to only focus on the third one, Susanna Klein. Sarah Hartwig, um, it, it is ironic that um, almost none of the historical accounts of the missions mention women and yet Sarah was on the very first uh, um, uh, ship that took missionaries to West Africa. 
and her husband, who turned out to be a bad lot thoroughly and became a slave trader, <laughs> um, had not told the society that he was going to get married, so they were presented with his wife at the last minute, and so she, she came out as well. And she spent two years in the uh, colony and um, then went back to England, um, the excuse being ill health, but her husband was already behaving in a rather wayward manner, and he left the Mission Society in a huff and went off and joined the slave trade. And she went back in 1815 and sadly died of yellow fever. The second woman is really interesting. The date in bracket, 1792, she is actually a former settler who came uh, with the 1,000 odd uh, former slaves from um, Nova Scotia. And um, she then married, she was a housekeeper to uh, a missionary, and um, uh, married him, and they went, and uh, she spent 10 years on the mission uh, settlement up in um, the Ponco River. And if you're looking, if you would like to know who was the first woman, woman to teach uh, African girls on a mission uh, station, um, and who started from the very beginning introducing uh, an ideology of white middle class domesticity, it's this woman. She's a black American, not a white European. And uh, again, uh, obliterated in, by history. Susanna Klein arrived a bit later, and um, I'm going to uh, take examples um, of what happened um, to Susanna. Um, it's very rare to find any pictorial representation. This is a silhouette. Silhouettes were a fashionable and cheap way of uh, reproducing somebody's um, uh, features. And there's Susanna in 1811. T 11. She looks very demure, but in fact she was what we would call a battle axe, I think. And both men and women were intimidated by her on the mission. Um, and she writes these marvelously fiery letters to CMS officials. Um, so that's what I'm going to um, uh, talk about. Um, actually, hang on a bit. Um, just to give you some context as to what happened um, and the um, material I'm going to look at. It, um, Susanna had been four years in, uh, in Sierra Leone when she wrote a letter to her uncle. A key to Susanna Klein is she had a famous uncle. And Uncle was one of the founder members of the Mission Society and also a very well-known public figure, religious commentator, evangelical social reformer and so on. And she used her uncle repeatedly to get what she wanted. Um, and um, in 1815, she wrote a letter to her uncle, and the letter's not survived, but he was so alarmed by the content of it that he forwarded it to the secretary of the Church Missionary Society, who in turn was so alarmed that he summoned the committee to a meeting, and they decided on the spot that they would send uh, the, the, the deputy secretary to uh, West Africa to, in, to inspect, to investigate. Um, as I say, the letter has been lost, but they, they requested information from two people, um, you know, presented them with these accusations and what did they think of them and so on. So from that basis, I've, from, from those two sources, I've been able to ascertain what she was talking about. And it seems that she was accusing uh, the missionaries of misdemeanors, uh, drunkenness uh, on the part of uh, Elizabeth Renner's husband, uh, which was ironic because Susanna's husband, within a year, was a serious alcoholic. But she accused another missionary of being an alcoholic. She accused um, one of profiteering, i.e. selling uh, mission supplies that arrived from England. Um, she accused them of public quarrelling. And the most intriguing, she said the mission houses were sinks of vice, etc. And I don't know what the etc. are is, or the sinks of, of, of vice, but I have um, speculated a bit. Anyway, the society was so long that they sent um, the deputy secretary to um, West Africa. He um, spent three months there and came back and wrote a report, both a public one and a confidential one. Um, and the examples I'm going to give now are taken from, there are two examples. One is from this inspection visit uh, or letters written around the inspection visit and the other is uh, uh, another incident a little bit later. 
And I think there are, it's important to uh, realize two things. At this time, women were not expected to have any input into public affairs at all. It was a male domain. They weren't expected to play any role in public life. Teaching girls in a mission school was an extension of their role in the family and household. And they were certainly not expected to uh, produce any critical opinions of public figures who were all men. And the notion of consulting women about anything was also completely um, out of the question. So it's within that context, what I'm now going to do is tell you what actually happened, and then I'm going to show some of the secondary uh, data around it. So, this is the secretary of the uh, Mission Society, the Reverend Pratt, writing to the deputy secretary, who had only just been appointed, uh, inviting him to go on this inspection visit. So he writes, we have had communications made to us which will render a visit to our African settlements by a friend in full possession of the views and wishes of the committee absolutely necessary. 9th of August 1815. Now Edward Pratt had only just been appointed, he was a bit sort of taken aback by this and he, his wife wanted to come along too. So he obviously expressed some reservations. So Pratt wrote another letter a few days later saying accusations and insinu insinuations are brought forward against some of the missionaries, which it is absolutely necessary should be examined on the spot. Right? So, no mention of a woman, no mention of who has produced these accusations and insinuations. Um, and um, the visit was announced in a, an evangelical periodical called the Missionary Register. It was a monthly publication. The Church Missionary Society always had entries, movements who'd arrived in Africa, and then later they had uh, mission uh, stations in uh, South Africa, and New Zealand, and India, and so on. And it was reported the visitor was to examine into every part of its concerns there, obtain accurate information, apply a present remedy to any evils which might have arisen. Um, <coughs> I suspect that letter writing was more formal at that time, and it may have been the case that using abstract nouns and the possess possessive form of the verb and so on was acceptable. But also I think that probably the secretary didn't want to admit that the woman lay behind the reasons for this visit. Um, so no mention of Susanna or of, uh, of, of women generally. Um, these were the private instructions that uh, the Deputy Secretary received. He was to establish and deal with cases of open sin, which meant drunkenness. They often referred to the sin of intoxication. And worldliness, which was the <coughs> accusation of profiteering. And then to inquire into all the topics in Mrs. Klein's communication. Now, these are private instructions. It makes very clear that Mrs. Klein is uh, behind the uh, investigations. I've just added, um, this person, Eugène Stock, wrote the first history of the Church Missionary Society in 1899, and you can see that he's somewhat um, uh, translated the uh, objectives of the mission to examine into the actual state of the mission to make or suggest plans for its more efficient. So, in other words, a kind of watering down of um, the uh, uh, reasons for the visit. Um, now, uh, Susanna herself was to be interrogated. Now the other, there were by this time a number of missionary couples, wives there. She's the only one who got into trouble. Um, and these were the private instructions to Mrs. Klein. Uh, communications were painful to the committee. She should have written to the secretary rather than to her elderly uncle who had been deeply alarmed. It was undesirable to have communications to him had gone abroad. And even Wil William Wilberforce had heard of them and he offered to come to London, busy man. Uh, offered to come to London to uh, discuss the matter and her uncle had also sent uh, copies of her letter to the president of the society, uh, an admiral called Lord, Lord um, Gambier. So the society was embarrassed, you know, that here were all these people outside the sort of closed committee who knew about it. And she was to explain all the grounds of her charges and there's this wonderful statement here that uh, uh, Edward Bickersteth was to tell her that scarcely one with whom she had been connected in Africa was not complained of her spirit 
evident that she has not had the rule over it. So in other words, she's got a bad temper and she can't control it. And then she's been charged with intermeddling with politics. This is actually, this actually means she's interfering in men's affairs, uh, which is the public affairs of the mission. And she opened her ear very early to untrustworthy men. So very clear that she's to be told off. Um, the the uh, deputy secretary spent three months there. He interrogated, he, he, he visited, the, there were by that time four mission stations. He visited them all, he spoke to all the missionaries. He took Susanna to task, and she admitted that she'd exaggerated a bit. Lots of tears all round. Men as well as women cried a lot in those days, so everybody in tears, and a lot of hand wringing, and, you know, we'll behave better in future. And Biggestiff came back, and he wrote um, a, a report that was actually published in the Missionary Register. Um, extracts of his journal were published in the Missionary Register. But privately, he produced a confidential report on each missionary, and he also, um, I found his uh, private diary, uh, which had some interesting information. And clearly, he didn't really like Susanna. He tried to be charitable, but he didn't really like her very much. Anyway, um, so how has this, so this is the data taken from the primary sources, taken from the letters and the committee minutes, minutes of committee meetings. So how has it been uh, reported in uh, uh, publications? So in the 19th century, uh, here's some examples. Uh, there was a lot of interest in Sierra Leone because of its um, origins, um, and there are a number of books written about the history of Sierra Leone. And there are a number of books written about uh, the early missionary period, not very many. Um, but anyway, here, um, 1851, so nearly 40 years later, Burks was the son-in-law of Edward Bickersteth. Uh, this is how he reports uh, this uh, visit. Bickersteth had striven with patience and gentleness to examine causes of dissension, to sift false reports, to remove hasty impressions, to restore those who have fallen. Um, now, Susanna's husband, Jonathan Klein, was uh, the worst culprit for, um, and in fact he was dismissed finally. Um, for having fallen, but to remove hasty impressions is definitely uh, Susanna. She was accused of being a gossip, of uh, accepting stories people told her too readily and reporting them to, to uh, her uncle in England. Um, Samuel Walker was a, a missionary, spent some time in West Africa, wrote an account in 1845. He says, disunion unhappily existed among these laborers. Dissensions had crept in where everything should have been sacrificed to harmonious cooperation. Um, and the third is uh, this history of the Mission Society in 1899. Sickness and death too frequently invaded the mission party. And worst of all, dissensions again arose amongst them because death was to set things in order generally. The visit corrected many evils. Now, this is the 19th, was the 19th century, and I suspect um, nobody wanted to. Uh, recognize that a woman had been behind a lot of this. Um, and as I said earlier, maybe uh, writing was more formal and they were less likely to use uh, personal name individuals and so on. So you can see that here they are using um, abstract nouns and, uh, and so on uh, and avoid saying who is the protagonists in all of this. So you might think, what about when you come to modern historians, 20th century historians, this, these sensitivities around women are not so obvious. Um, accounts are more forthright. Um, it's far enough removed from the actual uh, embarrassment of the incidents of the time. So you think that maybe 20th century, late 20th century historians might have a slightly different take on it. But I'm afraid, not really. Um, here are the three authors who've written the most about this period. It's just a very short period uh, in the very first decade of uh, mission activity. John Peterson is actually a Sierra Leonean. I don't know if he's still alive, but he wrote a history of Sierra Leone. And he wrote about fear. He's talking about the missionaries on the Pongo River because they were under threat of attack from hostile um, ethnic groups in the locality and by resident slave traders who thought that they were reporting the movement of slave ships. 
Because, of course, I should say, although Britain abolished the slave trade in 1807, it didn't stop it at all. And because Britain was at war with Napoleon, and the uh, Battle of Waterloo was 1815, they could never afford more than one or maximum two ships, they were all sailing ships, of course, to patrol what is about 3,000 miles of West African coast. And although they did capture uh, slaves, and uh, um, uh, was the colony of Sierra Leone grew primarily from what the people called liberated Africans, um, they, 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 um, the slave trade continued really unabated for about another four decades, at least. And of course, slavery still exists today. So the fear there is, is uh, fear of attack from hostile forces in the Rio Pongas. Fear increased the tension among missionaries outside Freetown which in turn led to almost incessant bickering as charges of drunkenness and profiteering were exchanged among them. Now, my evidence from reading all the letters, all the letters and reports, is that Susanna was the person who uh, <laughs> made the charges. And then, uh, secondly, Steve Jacobson, in 1972, wrote a book about uh, missions and slave trade in uh, uh, West Africa and the Caribbean. And he says, as reasons of the visit, tensions between the missionaries Charges of drunkenness and profiteering were exchanged amongst them. Actually, I think that I, I, I realize what I've done. I've um, uh, confused, I've forgotten which one is the quote, but anyway. The visitor asked the missionaries to present their views on the mission to give their arguments. Yeah? And the third one is an American academic, still active I think, reckless accusations of slave trading made by missionaries. Um, now, the, the, the noun missionary at that time was male. It referred only to men, because missionaries were men. So the women were missionary wives. Even though this society sent two single women to Sierra Leone in 1820, very early. But the, the, the word denoted a male person engaging in male activities in a male world. So by using the word missionaries, you are inevitably referring only to men. Um, so unfortunately, um, the conclusion we can perhaps draw is that these 20th century historians have just made use of secondary sources. Um, and so they have really reproduced uh, um, information as it was reported at the time uh, without considering there might be contextual factors that determine why uh, women were not mentioned and so on. Now, I think there's more to it than that, which I'll come to later, but, but I would suggest that they have relied heavily on secondary sources and um, Now, how to, uh, a second example, how to remove female agency. Um, Susanna and her husband moved regularly, and they didn't get on very well with, or she didn't get on very well with many people, and so she moved on, uh, they moved on regularly. Um, and they moved, um, uh, at one stage they moved to this place called Bramia, uh, which was up another river, and they stayed there less than a year, and they moved to the Ile de Los, so I should have pointed out on the map, the Ile de Los are opposite Conakre, which is the capital of Guinea now. Um, they moved to the Ile de Los, and then they didn't stay there very long, and they moved on again. So, um, Big Seth's published report, <coughs> talks of the reasons for the move from Bramia, difficulties in preaching, difficulty in procuring children for instruction, the uh, state of the buildings, and the local um, tribal leader was a mixed race Portuguese African called William Fernandez, who'd withdrawn his support. <coughs> now, he had withdrawn his support because he promised them, he had 47 children alive, and he promised to send many of his children to the school, and he never sent a single child. And so nobody else sent children because he was the sort of big, big chief of the area. And that was because he discovered that Jonathan Clive was an alcoholic, and he admitted that later. Um, so in fact, the, the reason for that move is not stated. So they then moved to the Ile de Los, where they were often housed by a former slave trader and plenty of children to teach. And Samuel Walker, uh, in 1845, says after six months on the island, despite the most encouraging success they were obliged to withdraw in consequence of the premises which they occupied being required by the owner for the purposes of trade. That's absolute rubbish. The truth is, from the primary sources, is that they hadn't been there for very long when Susanna started saying that this 
former slave trader who had given them the house to rent, and another slave trader, both British, that they were engaging in illegal trade. And illegal trade was smuggling, possibly. They, they, uh, British citizens who continued the slave trade were at risk of, if they were found guilty, of transportation to Australia. It became a very serious crime. And so they, they shifted to smuggling. And they would smuggle goods into the colony from uh, American ships. And they may also have been still engaged in slave trading. These islands were a, a hub of slave activity. Um, so in fact, Susanna started gossiping and saying, um, you know, these two men are engaging in illegal trade. She was probably correct. In fact, everything she said had a foundation to it. It's just that it wasn't acceptable for women to be outspoken. And she did kind of um, um, sort of um, exaggerate and embellish somewhat. Um, and so the slave trader who had given them the house said, no, you know, I'm not going to put up with this. You leave. January the 1st, you've got to leave. So they left. So, in fact, it wasn't, it had nothing to do with him wanting um, the uh, house back. Um, now, this example I've chosen because it actually shows, in the previous examples, it's a question of the historians um, being vague, being vague about who was behind uh, the uh, accusations of misdemeanor and, and uh, prompting the visit. Um, they haven't named anybody, they've just kept it very vague. Now I'm going to give an example of how, uh, so you could say they were economical with the truth in a way. Now I'm going to show how actually uh, the facts have been distorted and so we really do get false news. <laughs> and um, I've taken the example from this person. Now I have to say this is a PhD thesis from Uppsala University, uh, 1972, published. Now, <coughs> he wrote 150 pages about the missionaries in Sierra Leone. He never once mentions a woman. Not once. Except, in a footnote, he cites one of Sarah Hartwig's letters, which is a bit ironic to have no women at all, and, uh, but to cite a woman. So, just very quick, this is an earlier incident in 1812 when they were frightened of, uh, the missionaries were frightened of attack from, the Fula were northern Muslim uh, um, warrior tribes who actually brought most of the slaves down from the interior, down to the river, and then they were shipped off uh, across the Atlantic. Um, and so there was fear that they were going to be attacked. So this is what he wrote about this incident in 1812. Some Fula warriors had assaulted and burned down four Susu villages. Um, a missionary there fled in fear to Bashir with his pupils. Actually, Susanna fled with uh, um, another missionary had married a, a, a black settler from uh, North America. Um, the two women and the child of the black settler um, and some of their possessions moved to Bashir. The missionary, Jonathan Klein, did not move, right? <laughs> and then the second one, this is about when they uh, moved from this settlement of Bramia because the um, tribal leader had um, found out that Jonathan was an alcoholic. At the beginning, there were good relations between Klein and Fernandez, but they worsened fairly soon. The chief had promised that Klein should have children to care and educate. However, he never received any. The consequence was that Klein left Bramia and went to the Ile de Vos. So in other words, Klein is a bachelor on his own, and he's responsible for, um, for all of this. Um, and it goes on. Klein had been invited to the Ile de Vos by two British traders and had been promised many children to educate. At the beginning, all was well, he received 30 pupils, but an extensive slave trade was going on there, and when the missionary criticized it, the consequence that he was not accepted anymore. It was Susanna, not him. He, uh, what little I learnt about Jonathan was that unfortunately became an alcoholic, but he was a decent man. Everybody said he was a decent man and polite, and he did try hard, and he did teach children, and he did reform briefly at one stage. So the general consensus was that he was, uh, he was not a, a, a an unpleasant character, that, um, that, that she, she was the one behind um, everything. 
And then the other missionaries were very critical of him for his second removal. And once again, Klein moved. So Sudan has completely disappeared from the picture. Um, bear with me. And he, uh, this Jacobson's not the only person. What I think actually happened to him, he's writing a PhD, he's read all these secondary uh, accounts of the mission and uh, the colony, and he's got the perception, as I had initially, that there were just men there. There weren't any women, or if there were women, they were just silent kind of wives and helpmates and not responsible. I never actually read a single uh, <coughs> reference to a woman um, uh, taking any action. Female agency was completely missing from all these accounts. If women were mentioned at all, they were just as wives, companions and so on, and teaching the girls. So I think what happened was he maybe spent a year or two, you know, researching it all, and then he starts looking very closely at letters and reports, and he suddenly realizes there are women there, and he can't get his head around this, so he's had to modify the uh, historical facts um, to suit his narrative, um, and so that's what's happened. So I, I'm, I'm not sure that it was a sort of conscious. I mean, you could call this academic fraud, actually. It's not a con necessarily a conscious desire to distort the facts. It's the fact that people uh, have been so, um, from the literature, so accustomed to it being an all-male world and an all-male story that they haven't been able to, you know, move out of the box, so to speak. Now, um, and I'm going to, I'm, I'm finishing uh, in a minute, I'm going to just show uh, you a few examples. This is Bruce Musa, an American academic, who, who wrote a lot about the first woman, Sarah Hartwick, her husband, who left the Mission Society and became a slave trader. Um, and so he has transcribed, or got somebody to transcribe a lot of letters. The, the archives of the Church Missionary Society are held at the University of Birmingham. And he has transcribed a lot of letters. And uh, these are examples of where the transcription has overlooked the fact that it's a woman. Um, and this is a letter I said earlier that um, after S Susanna's accusations reached the committee in London, they invited two people to comment on uh, accusations. One person was another missionary who they didn't say, they didn't reveal to him who was the source of the accusations, but this person, Kenneth McCauley, they did. Um, society then was much more deferential than now, and this Kenneth McCauley was a notorious character, colonial officer in uh, Sierra Leone, was the cousin of one of the founder members of the Church Missionary Society, and they were like chalk and cheese. I mean, he was, <laughs> um, uh, you know, he, 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 um, he led a very dissolute life in, in Freetown and was very corrupt and so on. Uh, Zachary Macaulay was um, uh, one of those who uh, moved for the abolition of the slave trade and then slavery itself and so on and was a very pious and um, pious evangelical. Anyway, this is a letter, this is Kenneth Macaulay's letter to the secretary in London saying um, what um, uh, he thought. Now here, there, that says Mrs. Klein, um, and I did check with an archivist, that actually says Mrs. Klein. Uh, you can see it quite clearly here. Now, Musa's transcription says Mr. Klein. Right. Here, down the bottom, it says disagreements between her and Butcher. You can see. The disagreements between her, Butcher was another um, German missionary. Between her, this word is her, not him, but it's been transcribed as him. And here you can't actually see it, but up here is another reference to Mrs. Klein. Here. When Mr. and Mrs. Klein, uh, da, 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 here, sorry, this says something like, I've got it written here, uh, bear with me. Uh, when Mr. and Mrs. Klein left the Rio Pongas, endeavours were made to get them down to the colony, i.e. To, 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 to move into a mission station in the colony, but without effect, as both Butcher and Mr. Klein um, 
were averse to it, but this is very definitely Mrs. Klein. Now again, I, I'm not sure that it's a sort of conscious desire to <coughs> subvert the message. I think that it's, and it may be that it wasn't the academic himself who did the transcriptions, because there are a lot of transcriptions and the letters are really quite difficult to read. I mean, this one's quite clear compared to some. Um, I think that, as I said earlier, I think it's people, that historians not getting their head around the fact that not only were there were a lot of women there, but the women actually exercised agency and took decisions and uh, intervened and so on. And it has been a struggle to um, uh, recognize that. Um, and so, somewhat facetiously, <coughs> I've talked about whether it's male indigestion or indecipherable handwriting. But those are the examples. Oh, sorry. Those are the examples of where the um, words have been changed. But, so they've been changed so that it makes it appear to be that disagreements and dislike were between two missionaries, between Jonathan Klein and this Leopold Butcher, when in fact it was between Mrs. Klein, Susanna, and uh, uh, Leopold Butcher. Um, so, uh, this, uh, this research has taken me a long time because I learned early on that I couldn't trust any secondary sources. So in fact, I've written an account of these three women's lives, um, four or five chapters on each, and with very few exceptions, I've only looked at primary sources. And by primary sources, they were letters and uh, minutes of committee meetings. Even uh, reports, uh, the Society produced annual reports, it, published frequently in the Missionary Register, they have also been sort of doctored. So um, I had to rely on uh, uh, primary sources. Um, I want to just finish by reading something uh, from my book, just uh, to, to finish, and then, um, uh, 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 and very quickly to say what I, well, to say what I learned from this was that if a secondary source is really important to you for your own research, you need to think carefully. I would look much more closely at what the political, with a small p, the political context was. And I would also look at uh, where there are gaps, inconsistencies. Um, sometimes these historians are inconsistent. I mean, this Bruce Nusser knew perfectly well that it was Susanna Klein who made the accusations. But, you know, sloppiness or I don't know. Um, so I would look very closely and interrogate, you know, who was producing uh, the <coughs> evidence, uh, who for, why, what sort of <coughs> context they were working in, and so on. Um, and yeah, I, I, I just like to uh, finish with this um, uh, quote from my book. Given that most history until very recently has been written by men about men, such obfuscation and factual distortion may be more common than we think. If women's actions and words have sometimes been attributed to men, to men, then women may well have intervened more often in what was traditionally regarded as an exclusive male world than current historiography suggests. So, you know, it hasn't been a cover-up. Um, if, um, uh, if I was a supporter of Donald Trump, I'd talk about vested interests and, um, and cosmopolitan elites monopolizing the media and so on. Because I think that it's this very, very strong dominant narrative about men being um, responsible in the 19th century for uh, all public affairs that has made it even now. See, and although there are feminist histories uh, um, uh, about uh, women in um, uh, different parts of the world and so on, this early period has not been researched. It's, it's difficult to research, and almost all the the the, the, the uh, feminist writing about missionary women and so on has been much later in the century. So I don't know, um, uh, you may have uh, some interesting points to make about um, uh, your own experiences with secondary sources. Thank you.